So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, welcome to today's uh, Hyman Center speaker, speaker Series panel. My name is Marcia Stepanek, and let me just tame this little mic here. There we go. Um, I was the founding editor of Chief of Contribute Magazine, and I am the Hyman Center Senior Staff Advisor on New Media. And I also lecture on social media at the Center, and I'm curator of the series on disruptive innovation in the philanthropy sector. So I welcome you all here today. Um, for a few years now, as you all know, philanthropy has been undergoing some massive changes, and it continues to face a crisis of resources. A survey out earlier this week from the Chronicle of Philanthropy says that a majority of nonprofit leaders expect this season to be the worst ever for fundraising. And there are other challenges facing traditional philanthropy. A last month's Clinton uh, Global Initiative, Bill Clinton again, cited some of philanthropy's shortcomings, saying that in a world of growing problems, philanthropy cannot change the world on its own. New cross-sector partnerships, he said, are required for maximum impact. So this series is an attempt to explore, with those on the front lines of these changes, some of these next trends and new approaches. And excuse me, I have a cough today, <laughs> so excuse me. <coughs> Through April of next year, this series will spotlight some of the nation's brightest new change makers. We're going to be looking at filmmakers, philanthropists, futurists, social media experts, grassroots reformers, cell phone advocacy wizards, and other nonprofit leaders and social entrepreneurs. Each of them, as our panelists today, here, are helping to reshape how the giving sector looks, operates, collaborates, and serves. And we'll hope you'll join us at these upcoming panels as well. Before we get started, I want to recognize the founder and chair of the Hyman Center, Naomi Levine. Will you stand, please? Uh, she has been a, a wonderful director, resource, uh, big supporter of our series, and I want to thank you. So our topic today is for-profit philanthropy. Our panel today spotlights four social innovators and entrepreneurs who have broken with traditional philanthropy to create new ways to help those in need. And our moderator for today's, today's conversation on my far left and your far right is Dar Doug White, an esteemed philanthropy leader and the academic director of the Hyman Center. He also teaches ethics-based fundraising and board governance. Doug is the author of Charity on Trial which is a call for more financial oversight of nonprofits in the wake of current and ongoing scandals in, in the nonprofit space. His book also questions whether many nonprofits do enough good for the dollars invested in them. And Doug's latest book, which is out next Tuesday from Paul Graham Macmillan, is called The Nonprofit Challenge, Integrating Ethics into the Purpose and Promise of Our Nation's Charities. To his right and your left, is Jane Slusser, Chief Service Officer at catchafire.org, which is a new for-profit B corporation that connects professionals who want to volunteer their skills with nonprofits and social enterprises. Jane was one of the many young social change advocates working at the forefront of President Obama's grassroots election campaign. She helped to lead his volunteer army in New York during the 2007-2008 election season. And she continues to advocate for more effective social innovation. Jane steps in today to substitute for Jen Lynn of Cycle for Survival, who was unable to make it due to an especially difficult recent round of treatments. Jane Slusser, thank you. We're delighted and honored to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Seated next to Jane is Michael Norton, who we're delighted to note is joining our panel this morning via NYU's Reynolds Fellowship Program for Social Entrepreneurship. Michael is a visiting scholar to this Falls Reynolds Fellows, and we're lucky to have him here with us this morning. Michael is one of the world's original social entrepreneurs, a social entrepreneur before it became an academic focus, or I think even named. Uh, he's worked for uh, going on 30 plus years in the United Kingdom to catalyze ordinary citizens to do good. And he co-founded the Directory of Social Change in 1975 to provide training and support to voluntary organizations. Excuse me. He co-founded Changemakers in 1994 to find new ways to engage young people in social action. He founded Youth Bank UK in 1998 to encourage and enable young people to act as grant makers to support local projects run by other young people. And for many years now, 
Michael has been a leader at the Center for Innovation and Voluntary Action, which is a group he founded to help people to start up social good projects from concept to operation. His book, 365 Ways to Change the World, is all about his view of what he calls the, quote, ordinary philanthropist. Michael, thank you for joining us today. And to the left of Mike is Mark Lane, who we're also delighted to have him today from Chicago, where he runs a private wealth consultancy and is one of the leaders at the forefront of today's controversial movement to legalize for-profit social enterprises in all 50 states. And if I don't lose my voice, <laughs> I apologize. Mark wrote the legislation legalizing so-called L3C corporations in Illinois, and he'll talk to us a bit more, I'm sure, about why he thinks the proliferation of so-called low-profit, limited liability companies are critical to encouraging social innovation in the United States. And last, but definitely not least, is Glenn McDonald, the co-founder of the Wealth and Giving Forum here in Manhattan. It's a collective of high net worth philanthropists and social innovators, some of whom have been leaders in the nation's mission investing movement. <laughs> mission investors, as most of you know, seek opportunities to align a foundation's financial investments with the mission of the organization, but all while earning financial returns on those philanthropic investments. Glenn is an esteemed thinker who bridges his stellar Renaissance background in scholarly research and international politics with his expertise as a business management expert and strategist. And he combines all of that with an abiding passion for promoting ever more effective philanthropy in my family's means. So before I lose my voice, my voice completely, I'm going to turn this over to Doug to moderate. And let's give Doug and our esteemed panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marcia, and I also want to thank Marcia, too, for being such a leader in putting this series together. We might have some trouble with this, but we'll deal with it. Don't worry. I also think that this is one of the large first moments at the Hyman Center and perhaps of philanthropy in the nonprofit world in general, because these are the series that are going to ask very important questions. So pay attention to what these people say, and later we'll have a chance for questions from the audience. Now, getting to the issue here, one of the things about the Hyman Center that I would like to see happening more and more is that we go beyond the ideal of philanthropy and find out how it is that we are philanthropists, how we are affecting philanthropy. And as I hear your esteemed bios, and I think that I am, and we all are very lucky to be in your presence, I'm hearing something beneath, beneath the surface. I'm noticing that none of you is a president or CEO of a traditional charity. None of you is a traditional fundraiser. You're all in philanthropy. You're all in the world of nonprofits. But the question I have is, is there a sense of frustration among any of you or all of you with the world of philanthropy as it is today? I'm going to start with you, and we'll go all the way down the way to start our conversation. Um, yes, hello. Um, I would say that uh, coming from the volunteer standpoint, um, there's, there's two different ways that you can traditionally give back. And of course, the first that we all think of is donate money to a charity that you really care about or a cause that you're really passionate about. Um, and another way to do that, which is what Catchfire tries to enable, is to actually give your time um, because it's much more, it can be much more meaningful. You're all right. Um, it can be much more meaningful for you to actually get connected to the organization that you're working with. I definitely had that same experience um, working on the Obama campaign. Started out very early in 2007 um, when the main focus um, for people getting involved was actually doing fundraising. Um, and it was not something that I felt I was particularly good at um, or that I was particularly motivated to do. Um, and so as the campaign went on and there was more of a role for a volunteer to utilize the types of skills that I had, I found that I became much more involved, I gave much more time, and I clearly felt like I made a much bigger impact. And with Catch a Fire, you know, we know that uh, as the rate of donors is, is definitely not as what it used to be, um, the volunteer rate is also dropping. Um, it's dropped since 2005, it recently had a little uptick, um, but we want to really understand what the problem is and why people don't want to give their time and why they think it's easier to send in a check for $50 than to go in and actually get involved with this organization. Um, everyone in this room I know probably has a lot of great professional skills that an organization could really use access to. And so we focus on getting you connected in an easy way that is 
clearly defined so that before you get involved, you know what you're getting into um, because we feel like that um, gives you an opportunity to have a much better experience and to make a much bigger impact on the organization than just sending in that check once a year um, to you know, a few places that you're only marginally interested in because you don't really have a, a real connection to. Michael? Yeah, I, I want to talk more about individual philanthropy than institutional philanthropy, so not foundations or, or, or corporate grant makers. Um, I've been watching this space for 50 years now, and one thing that occurs to me is the, uh, the relationship between the non-profit and the supporter has deteriorated. Um, non-profits become highly professional. Uh, they've become run with departments to generate money and a separate department to implement the work. And this causes all sorts of problems. Uh, the first is that they make promises they can't possibly keep. So the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children made a promise, it was full stop, full stop to child abuse. Just give us the money and, and we'll stop it. Now, they can't do that, uh, short of castrating every male in, 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 in the world. Uh, and Oxfam had another thing, text Fred and we'll solve poverty. Again, you can't do it. They also are um, very dismissive of the talents and uh, the resource of their supporters. So in the 1960s, when Amnesty International was being set up, a group of Amnesty volunteers would be given three prisoners, and they'd be told to do whatever they could to get them out of prison. One was in the north, one the south, one the east, uh, so there was no political bias. And those people were hugely committed to the task and they would go on hunger strikes, they'd chain themselves to railings, they'd send letters to everyone, uh, they'd go and meet the presidents of oppressive regimes and say illegal things. They did what it took to get those prisons out. Today at Amnesty all you can do is to become uh, a sort of internet volunteer, uh, rapid response. So they'll send you an email, you'll add your address and it will be sent off to someone they've determined. They've taken the creativity out of the relationship of, of, of their supporters. And I could cite this uh, again and again as something that, 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 that has happened. And I believe that we can only change the world together and that non-profits ought to be acting as a mechanism for amalgamating the uh, resources, the creativity, the talents, the contacts of all their supporters to address the problem not to be a professional staff working in an office and a professional fundraising uh, group working in another office using lies mostly to raise money from people. I'm going to come back to that particular uh, line of thought in a little bit because I think there's some, some interesting fodder for uh, controversy and perhaps some other ideas as well, but that's a very interesting opening line. Thank you. Let's uh, continue on. Mark. Uh, Doug, pleasure to be with all of you today. Appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. I believe your question was uh, frustration with philanthropy. That's correct. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, all of us, I believe, are in the empowerment business here, and uh, I am uh, not frustrated with philanthropy. I obviously bemoan the fact that last year the nation's 400 largest charities saw their giving decline by 11%. Uh, and I think it's only fair to recognize that um, philanthropy, while it has a significant role in driving positive social change and ameliorating social problems, by no means does it have a monopoly on driving positive social change. And uh, w where uh, I represent foundations and charities and individual philanthropists and others who are socially conscious and seeking to improve societal conditions, uh, I, I see the philanthropist really as a, a catalyst to attract private sector capital because uh, it seems to me without private sector capital, social problems cannot be adequately addressed. There simply isn't enough philanthropy to achieve uh, meaningful uh, uh, moving of the dial. So uh, I have no frustration about philanthropy, however I think we properly should understand that philanthropy has its limitations and uh, to the extent we can use uh, philanthropy catalytically, 
uh, I think we're most likely to achieve the objects we're all out to achieve. I think everyone so far has said something that's going to create some conversation for later on. But let me go to our final person right now. And Glenn, what are your thoughts about why you're where you are? Well, I'd like to pick up where Michael left off and talk about the supply side, the donors. My frustration is with the donors. Um, Claude Rosenberg, a wealth advisor in San Francisco, wrote a book about a decade ago in which he kind of did a macro analysis of the top 10,000 families in this country. And if they could keep their current consumption pattern for the next three generations and still have their assets grow somewhere between 6 and 8 percent, the wealthy are under giving $50 billion annually just in this country alone. That's a lot of capital. And that c capital can be put to work. Time value of money works in philanthropy just the way it does in business. A dollar spent today mm -hmm. but spent well is better than a dollar spent tomorrow. And two dollars spent today but spent well is much better than two dollars spent tomorrow. There's a lot out there. Now, I want to pick up where Michael left off because there are a lot of great organizations that don't oversell, um, that are putting their heart and their passions to work. And the donors are requiring too much rigor and too much measurement to prove outcomes beforehand. And the role of philanthropy is to take the risk. Take the risk and show government what can be scaled. You're right. Governments are the only ones who are going to scale some of the solving of these social problems. Of course, we can talk about social enterprises and their role in sustaining socially, uh, uh, social organizations to, to uh, embed it in the fabric of our economy. Um, but that role of philanthropy is critical, and it's um, being underutilized because of the hesitancy of donors to, to get on with it. Uh, just as a, a program note, I think you should know that the book to, to which uh, Glenn is referring is called Wealthy and Wise. And, uh, Claude, unfortunately, died just a few years ago. Uh, a gentle <coughs> giant in the world of philanthropy and a thought leader that uh, we all are uh, worse off for not having any longer. But I think what you're saying is, is, is quite relevant. But I do want to go back here and ask um, you, Michael, what it is about the world of philanthropy where you see so much failure. You've given a few examples. But would you agree with Glenn that there are a lot of other good examples where people are not overselling, or is this just the way it's going and it's getting worse? I think, I think there's a trend, and it is the way things go uh, with the best will in the world. That there's a tension between fundraising and delivery, and also uh, between professionalism and the use of, 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 of sort of uh, mass volunteering. Uh, but I'd like to say something else also, yeah. which is that I went into this uh, as a young man, uh, hoping to create a better world and pass on a better world to the next generation. Uh, I think we failed. I think we failed lamentably. The world is, in many ways, far more problematic now for all sorts of reasons than it was when I was young. Uh, so we may look at the, the micro level and look at problems, and, and we've made progress, for example, on uh, dealing with cancer, uh, just as an example. But looking at the wider world, I don't think the philanthropic sector and people uh, as volunteers, the civil society, has actually uh, made a better world. Sure, it would be worse if we hadn't engaged in it. Uh, and it may be that philanthropy is on its own not sufficient to solve the problems of the world. And um, I'd like to give two examples from South Africa, where I recently was. I, I visited a, a center uh, which was for uh, orphans and AIDS-affected children, uh, very young, sort of two upwards. Um, and it was run by a white South African with a team of people, all of whom had enormous amounts of energy, commitment, and passion for what they were doing. Uh, they had money from uh, philanthropy, and they had money from the uh, uh, Cape Town government uh, to do this. They had about a million pounds, which is a lot of money in South Africa, to set up this centre. Um, and one of their programmes was called Fit for Life. It was for girls growing up, and it was uh, to impress on them the way in which they should be living their lives to avoid problems in the future. And I noticed in the Fit for Life group, there were about uh, 12 girls. Two of them were already pregnant in their early teens. And I noticed on the streets, as I uh, went out after that meeting, uh, girls three or four years later with two or three children in their arms and a bit of cardboard saying, help me, I'm destitute, I've been abandoned. 
And it just seemed to me that there wasn't enough philanthropic money or enough commitment and passion amongst volunteers and social entrepreneurs to solve the problem. And that we're going to have to look for new ways of solving problems. Uh, and <coughs> that leads in two directions. One is the engagement of people themselves in solving their own problems, rather than having problems solved for them. And secondly, uh, social enterprise as a, as, as a model uh, so that you can develop things which can spread much more widely. And I'd just like to give another example of that. We are setting up a foundation in South Africa called Unlimited South Africa. It's related to a foundation I've set up in the UK to make awards to people who have ideas for making the world better. One of the people who's approached us is a 52-year-old nurse, uh, and she wants to dispense drugs in her township on the street corner in the evenings and weekends. The alternative is you go to the district hospital. It costs a fortune in taxi rides to get there. You wait all day, and you're probably not seen, and you've lost a day's work. So by charging a small amount to dispense medicines to local people at times that they can afford to do it, she will make an additional income for herself as a nurse. If she can make this work, then w she has invented a whole new mechanism for distributing medicines in South Africa, uh, which are not being distributed properly at the moment. It's not philanthropy, it's not charity, it's business. It's a social business, a micro-business, funded perhaps by microfinance, but it has the potential to solve one problem in a country that is full of many problems. I see, Jane, that you're nodding your head throughout that entire revolutionary dialogue here, and I'm wondering if you agree with it, and if you do or not, uh, how that fits into what you're doing. Um, yes, well, I definitely agree with your earlier statements about the fact that you, you talk to an organization and they, they really have split up their, their main goal is fundraising so much rather than focus on the program. I talk to so many nonprofits and social enterprises every week, and, and usually when I talk to the nonprofits, I ask them, what do you need help with? And can anybody here guess the number one thing that they always tell me they need? Money, 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 money. And they want me to send in a volunteer to help them get money. But what I want to do is I want to send in a volunteer to help them with their program. I want to send in a volunteer who can help with their budget so they can maybe figure out why the money that they have isn't working in the way that they want it to. I want them to think about what their programs are and how they can improve efficiencies there. Um, and so I think that a lot of organizations get so focused on that that they lose sight of what they're actually supposed to be doing. Um, so in another way, the way that we try and send in our volunteers is not only to remove that focus from fundraising, but is to make these nonprofits as efficient as businesses. Um, that's why another sort of revolutionary thing about what we do at Catch a Fire is the fact that we charge nonprofits for our service. Um, which you know, a lot of organizations see it as a great thing because they're getting access to professional services that are worth thousands of dollars. Others are completely shocked that I would be charging them for a volunteer. Um, but the reason we do this is to make sure an organization actually has a use for that volunteer. And if that volunteer isn't worth the investment for them to pay for us to find them, then it's not really worth the time that an organization would use the volunteer for. So if they don't really need to have a social media campaign, I don't want to send somebody in to do that. Because if they can't afford the $200, they can't, they can't afford the 50 hours of time that they're going to invest into that every week or every month. Um, so it's really getting nonprofits to think about their programs in a more business-like way and think of the return of investment on their time as well as their money. I want to come back to something you just said a moment ago. Uh, Jane, about uh, the phrase uh, having nonprofits become as efficient as businesses. And I'm hearing in that inherently uh, a goodness and efficiency. Well, how do you do that in a nonprofit world, in your view? How do you find efficiency? Um, well, I think one of the important things, and I see this with a lot of the organizations we work with, we actually work with social enterprises who try and make sure that their bottom line is tied to doing good and actually staying in the business. Um, and so that's why we're a for-profit, is we realize that you know, we have this, this business model, we, continue, we can continue to do good and keep ourselves afloat and actually scale the business. And I think that's why we see a growing movement with social enterprises, because exactly as Michael mentioned, there's a divorce in the programming and the fundraising. And so you have two completely different priorities within the organization, which don't work very well for getting things done, which is why we've seen a lot of things not work out so well. 
So I think that what we see is nonprofits starting to think about ways that they can generate income related to their programs and to support their programs so that they're not constantly going in two different directions. What I'm hearing right now is uh, such a departure from the way we think of philanthropy and raising money in the nonprofit world. Most of us are familiar with the phone call from the charity or the solicitation by mail from the charity, and it's a large, well-known charity, or your own alma mater, or your charity down the street, whatever you might be close to. And we're hearing some rather interesting departures from that thinking. And I'm thinking, well, gee, there might be this need for a, a different legal model. And um, that's been explored. And, and, and I, I want to ask um, Mark, who's been really pioneering this idea, uh, what that legal model is that you've been working on is called an L3C. What is that exactly? Well, let me first say that uh, I teach the social enterprise course at Northwestern University School of Law, uh, and uh, we focus on lots of different emerging business models, the L3C being one of them. But there are a number of platforms and vehicles in the toolbox today that would allow uh, for-profits businesses to be established with uh, social missions uh, in, uh, and concurrently uh, solving a number of legal impediments to having a for-profit social purpose business, whether it is a subsidiary or an affiliate of a charity, uh, and probably half of them are in that category, or whether it's a freestanding social purpose business. There are serious governance issues associated with uh, operating a business in a way that is not intended exclusively to drive shareholder financial value. Uh, the laws of all 50 states presume that management has that overarching fiduciary duty. In 31 states, there's an opportunity to overcome that presumption. Uh, but this is really reflective of uh, a core uh, tension between driving profits and driving mission, uh, no money, no mission. Uh, so it's important that to the extent charities are to become more self-sustaining, self-reliant, to the extent that they want to establish uh, earned income strategies where they can become less dependent upon charitable giving, uh, less dependent upon government support, which obviously is uh, cannot be counted on, to the extent that for-profit entrepreneurs who have social agendas can be encouraged to pursue those agendas. We need to find legal solutions. Uh, and there are lots of different ways to do that and lots of different vehicles to achieve that. The low-profit limited liability company is one. And uh, I, uh, that law now exists in seven states. Uh, it passed one of the houses in New York. I happen to be licensed to practice law here, so I'm very interested in that specifically. Uh, and I've drafted most of the L3C legislation around the country. The uh, intent is to facilitate a certain form of investment from foundations uh, to leverage that investment to secure private sector capital. Let me explain briefly the genesis of this. Um, since 1969, as a trade-off for the tax benefits they enjoy, foundations, grant-making organizations, have been obliged to distribute 5% of their assets annually for charitable purposes. Up until that point, foundations, many of them established by the robber barons of the 19th century, were hoarding assets. And although the donations to those foundations were tax deductible and the earnings generally tax exempt, the money did not go out for charitable purposes. So Congress acted and said, you must distribute at least 5% every year to preserve your tax status. This is what accounts for the feverish competition for grants among charities. What's less understood is that the same law provided an alternative to satisfy that 5% distribution requirement, and that is the program-related investments. A foundation may, in fact, make an investment, even an equity investment, even in a for-profit enterprise, so long as it meets certain characteristics, being charitable in nature, first among them. And that investment will count against the 5% distribution requirement. All things being equal, one would assume that foundations would prefer to make investments over grants. With a grant, you write a check, you keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best, but the money's gone. It's an expense. 
when you make an investment, whether it's debt or equity or some hybrid instruments, the, the asset remains on the books of the foundation, ideally to be recovered, even with earnings one day, and recycled. So you have a financial multiplier effect in an investment, and consequently a social multiplier effect in an investment that you don't have in a, in a grant. Nevertheless, for lots of technical reasons, most foundations historically have shunned uh, uh, program-related investments in favor of grants. Well, the new L3C, which is the low-profit limited liability company, is one step in the direction of freeing up those, that investment capital out of foundations. The intent is that if you have a social purpose, for-profit business, the foundation does the heavy lifting. It comes in at the first tranche or layer of investments, although there are lots of paradigms, I'm giving you one. The foundation forgoes market rate returns, settling for disproportionately low equity stake or low interest on a coupon. By virtue of that money coming in, and by virtue of the foundation saying, hey, we don't need a full return in terms of market rates, that then subsidizes investment returns to private sector players who come in on the strength of that investment. And they're paid at market rates. So the intent is really to encourage private sector investment into the social sector. And that's what the L3C is mostly about. We are in a new world, it looks like. All three of you so far have talked about a brand new world and different angles. What is your perspective of that? And I have a follow-up question for you, but I need your perspective, Glenn, on what you've just heard. Okay, I'll give it to you now. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure all of us have heard that the true meaning of philanthropy is love man, and really in some basic definition, it's called love self. I think you need to turn on your microphone. I'm sure all of you have heard that the basic definition, the, the fundamental definition of philanthropy or philo is, is love of your, a love of man. And it starts with love of yourself. And basically you give to others understanding that, gosh, if I were in that situation, I sure would want somebody to lend me a helping hand. And I don't think we should forget that when we're trying to steward philanthropy to the next place. Uh, Pearl and Nee, who runs uh, great nonprofits out in San Francisco, was a founder of the Stanford Social Innovation Review, once said that numbers suppress empathy. And one of the things I'm concerned about as we create new constructs that I support, by the way, and that um, come up with new hybrid models and new measurement frameworks, and that we do run nonprofits efficiently, is that we start to look like industry and we forget the philo in what we're doing. And I think that would be a real sad day. So that's one thought. And the second comment I have is, um, you know, the, the is about, about social enterprises and about these new constructs. Um, why, first of all, so, to, to me, uh, Thomas, Jefferson, Thomas um, Edison was a social entrepreneur. I think by creating a light bulb and allowing people to see at night, created safety, created, um, eliminated some eye problems from people who were trying to study in the evening way back before there was light, which is now a social problem in, in Latin America with people reading with uh, smoke lamps and straining their eyesights and, and getting health problems. Uh, well, he created, he was, you know, he was at the beginning of what became Con Edison and General Electric. Um, and I think we need to remember that. Take an insurance company. The first, one of, Northwestern Mutual was founded by a guy who was a pioneer in the 1850s and he pulled money, mutual, to create benefit for everybody. So that if a family breadwinner died, they would take care of one another. Was that a social enterprise? It became Northwestern Mutual, it's a Fortune 115 companies. So my question to Mark and, and the rest, and all of us, is a challenge, is as we create these new classifications, and you see this when you create anything that's green and organic, all of a sudden, every label in the supermarket is green and organic. Are the institutions that already exist out there going to say, we qualify, and come in and change the nature of our sector? And I think that's a risk. And it maybe it's an opportunity if we play it right. But I think those are the things that come to mind as I listen to some of the other comments. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, your point about uh, definitions, I think, is, uh, is apt. Uh, the Social Enterprise Alliance on whose board I sit, uh, the membership organization of social enterprises, 
will uh, next week have its uh, national board meeting in Chicago. My law firm was engaged to develop a definition for social enterprise that could be the subject of a certification program. Uh, and we've already filed a trademark, uh, and there will be accredited social enterprises. Uh, and uh, we need to distinguish between socially responsible investing on the one hand, and I'm very much involved in that as well. I own a socially responsible investment firm. Look up advocacyinvesting.com. You'll like it. <laughs> um, little plug. Uh, and we also need to distinguish social enterprise from corporate social responsibility. Every business fills a need for a product or a service or it would exist. That doesn't make every business a social enterprise. It has to do with whether the business is directly impacting a social problem, and that's in its DNA. That's what it's about, is to solve the problem. So if we have a venture that is a workforce development or a recovery housing uh, a, a program, uh, these are social enterprises. Uh, they become self-reliant through earned revenue. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, the philanthropy that you're describing isn't in the heart of the social entrepreneur. It needs to be. Uh, I, I do believe in metrics. Uh, this is something I uh, feel very strongly about. Uh, I'm writing a book on social enterprise. I've actually already written it. It'll be published early next year by the American Bar Association. It'll be the first book for lawyers in this country about social enterprises. And I believe that the professions have a special responsibility to be agents of change, not only to respond to client inquiries, but to be proactive and introduce opportunities for empowerment to clients. So, and I think part of this whole social enterprise mix and culture needs to be increased attention on not merely activities, but outcomes, and outcomes as a proxy for impact. Without that, you don't really have anything at all. Um, Mission-related investing uh, again, a subset of social responsible investing is something that I am personally passionate about, supportive of, and uh, some, uh, 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 something of a, an emissary for. Uh, within this stacked capital structure of these social enterprises, if we see the foundation is going in at the first level, socially conscious individuals, other institutions are coming above, each uh, with a different um, financial, social objective calculus. Uh, Mission-related investing comes back in there. In fact, many of the foundations who invest in L3Cs, first with program-related investments, come back in subsequent tranches with mis as mission-related investors out of their corpus because they have confidence in the management of the company, they understand its social mission, they want to back that mission, and they serve essentially as social venture capitalists, which is what the L3C and some of these other forms uh, permit a foundation to do. So I think it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of my response. Just go ahead, one more right post on that. I'm going to be very, very yes. brief. I may not be. The word, <laughs> the word social is really subjective. And what is socially beneficial to one group versus another is really subjective. And I just think we need to be very clear that what, what prevents a family from bankruptcy due to a life insurance policy that covers, provides them the capital need may be considered social. So I just think that we have to get to, I, I think the standards are going to be subject to that subjectivity. That's my, uh, only, can, that's my only point. Let I me think just hold off on, on We can be clear on the lack of clarity. And I think it's really emerging from this conversation from all four of you that we are using vernacular that's all either new or not universally understood or agreed upon. Uh, but I, since you two haven't talked about this particular question that Mark has brought up, I'd like your views on what you've just heard. First of all, from you, Jane. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that it's very important to think about how we're actually defining these organizations. And um, you know, I, I mentioned that we deal with social enterprises. There's no way to say you are or you are not a social enterprise. We can write up a list of, of my qualifications or, or common things that we think these places have in common. I can say I'm only going to work with a certified B corporation because somebody else has vetted you. Um, uh, and so I think it's very important that there is a, a clear guideline there. At the same time, you mentioned a really great organization, great nonprofits, because I think that um, you know, the, in the nonprofit space, there sometimes is a lack of transparency and accountability. And in the same way that you know, so, something I might think is a really great nonprofit, somebody else might not think that that's very good for the social good. Um, and so it's actually having these guidelines beforehand to sort of get around those arguments of, of what is the social good is, is very important. Um, well, Michael, can I have a quick thought from you on that point? Yeah. Um, 
that there's a lot of confusion about terms. And there's no confusion. About no, there is. Oh, there's there is. Lot. Okay. There's a lot. I was, and, and but I missed something there. And in, in the UK today, a lot of people who uh, were charities now call themselves social enterprises. Uh, and it's become a trendy term, and they think they can get more money if they call themselves a social enterprise. They're basically no different from what everyone was doing 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and uh, the, the, the driving force for this has been, in, in the UK, was a government wanting to see social enterprise uh, be developed further. So everyone started calling themselves social enterprises, joining the social enterprise coalition, etc., etc. But to me, it stems from the social entrepreneur and what they want to do and how they want to do it. And we all have a choice uh, when we're starting out with a venture as to whether we will be a pure charity, well, whether we will earn some money, whether we'll be uh, a social enterprise or even a social business, which I think is at the extreme of the spectrum. Um, and how we set ourselves up also depends on, determines the sorts of funding we're seeking. I don't think it's uh, right and proper for a grant-making foundation to make a grant to a profit-making body uh, just like that, because uh, the, the, the money, in, in, in essence, in the long term, will just go uh, to the bottom line to be distributed as profit. Uh, I think it is right that, uh, that they invest in uh, shares in the company uh, if they want to, and I'm setting up a an LLP at the moment, Limited Liability Partnership, to take a social venture forward, uh, which is the equivalent of Kickstarter. It's a crowdfunding website called BuzzBank. I think it goes live today uh, and goes public in November. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do not want grants because uh, it's, we, we see ourselves as a commercial enterprise uh, uh, for public benefit. What we want is to have the majority of our shareholding in non-profit hands. Uh, we want to have a cap on our, our income so that above certain levels, increasing proportions uh, go to a foundation. Uh, and we, 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 we want to serve the, 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 the social mission in preference to the, the, the commercial mission. But we also want to be a business. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the solution I, I had for that was that we would uh, seek investment from foundations, not grants from foundations. And to me, that's a much better line of accountability for a social enterprise than getting a grant. I have one final question of this group before we have a couple of minutes for the audience to ask questions. It goes back to something that uh, Glenn said. You used this phrase and you buried it into another idea, and I want to bring it back out of, for a minute. You said that numbers suppress empathy. And we talked about numbers before we sat down here today, and I want to know what you mean by that, because we're so numbers driven. You, in fact, use the quote or the, 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 the data, the fact that at large charities around the United States, giving has dropped by 11%. And you said that to say something else. And I'm just wondering, if we're using these numbers, what are we saying? How are we using them? Or do you think we're sometimes misusing them? Or do you think we're sometimes misappropriating uh, them? If you look at great organizations, like New York University, for example, like New York University, yes. Just thought I'd mention. If if they only measured numbers, they'd probably be missing the boat. Um, if, if great organizations across history and cultures work when they have leadership, when they have great internal cultures, when they have values, when they stick to those values, and when they measure what they're doing, but if they only measure and don't do the other things they're not going to be um, effective and they're not going to sustain themselves. And that's true in the nonprofit world, it's true of, in a for-profit world, and it's true in government. It doesn't matter. Robert Kaplan uh, at the Harvard Business School pioneered about 20 years ago something called, 25 years ago, something called the balanced scorecard. And he did a study of the major corporations in this country and the ones that maintained their profitability had great performance metrics on the qualitative and the quantitative not just the quantitative, a, a company driven just to profit, even if it's, its original mission is profit, and doesn't look at the other indicators of performance, is eventually going to fail. It's not going to be viable. So when I say numbers suppress um, empathy, I have two issues. One, I don't think we should forget 
the role of philanthropy and the fact that it should start from the heart first and the mind second, because I think we'll lose sight of what we're trying to accomplish. And that's, that's number one. And, and, and I, I think that culturally these organizations are going to be better off if they remain empathetic as they're measuring. So that's my point. And Jane, just quickly to follow that up, that connects something with what you said about efficiency in organizations. Would you agree uh, with Glenn's position on this point? Yeah, I think one of the really interesting things to, to hop on what you were speaking about there is that with a nonprofit, you're obviously, you, you want there to be a certain level of efficiency so that that organization is doing good, but there's also a certain level of forgiveness and not perhaps holding them to the same level of high performance that you have for a Fortune 500 company. And you also mentioned something earlier about you know there's a bigger risk there, um, where you're not necessarily going to you're not going to see a necessarily a payoff, um, or if that's what you're expecting, you're not going to see results as quickly. Perhaps I think it's good to have that level of accountability there, so that you're not throwing money mm -hmm. away and not actually doing the good. But the, there's definitely it, it needs to come from the heart, um, and there needs to be a desire to do good. Um, and sometimes that involves um, having a little bit more patience and forgiveness than a for-profit business model normally allows. Okay. Well, thank you. I would like to ask if anyone in the audience has some questions. Mrs. Levine has one, and there are a few up here. Why don't we begin with Mrs. Levine, because it's only right. <laughs> we have a microphone right there for you, Mrs. Levine, right behind you. I'm not sure I agree Listen. with anything that the speaker said. Put a microphone in front of her. And if you'll uh, forgive me, let me uh, comment from a, I am a fundraiser, unlike all of you, and I came to NYU when it was bankrupt in 1978, and I saw what happened here, not only because it had vision and it had great leadership, but it had a very strong uh, fundraising program. Now, the one thing that bothered me, it makes me get up and sound so negative, is that you talk about the desire of making the nonprofits more like business. It went through every comment that was made. What business? Enron, Wicon, General Motors, the agriculture industry, the financial industry, the banking industry. American business has not exactly been the kind of model that I would place on a pedestal and say, let's follow. So when people say that, when people say that, I'm bewildered. Now that doesn't mean that nonprofits are all good. Obviously they're not. There's inefficiency and mismanagement, but I could take every company in the United States and I could find a lot of mismanagement, a lot of unethical behavior, a lot of things that I'm glad that nonprofits are not doing. So uh, excuse me if I start off on that because that comment always drives me nuts because I do read the papers every day. I am interested in economics and finance and I look at our profit world and I'm a little unhappy about it. So don't tell me about that. Second, uh, <laughs> Jane, uh, you said that uh, an organization uh, should not concentrate on the money, but on the program. If you're a good fundraiser, you don't go out and say, give me money. You go out to sell a program. The two things are entwined. And if you just sell program without being interested in who's going to support it financially, the program won't, won't exist. So I hate to see that dichotomy uh, uh, set, because I know the two work together or they're not going to work at all. I was a director of the American Jewish Congress for many years. It was an organization that prided itself on its great intellectual capacity. We were the lawyers for the Jewish community. We didn't want to bother with something as mundane as fundraising. Well, the American Jewish Congress went bankrupt and is now being taken over to the American Jewish Committee. And I have never forgotten that lesson. And I was at fault as well as everybody who worked there. So I'm very cautious about trying to separate fundraising from mission. I also am troubled by the concept of investment being better than granting. I think both are necessary. It is very important for the nonprofit organizations to get their grants to exist. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't have investment. I also feel that many people underestimate what the nonprofit world has done as against the business world. Look at our colleges, our universities, our hospitals, our research, the thousands of social service agencies that are doing very well. Our country wouldn't be what it is today without them. So I end by saying yes, all innovation is very good. 
But let's not forget that there's a lot of good things happening in the nonprofit. And please don't tell me to model myself after American business. <laughs> well, while Robert brings the microphone down to the front because we have some can, questions there, can, I would like to ask. To respond? Yes, I was just going to say, while that happens, I know so, that somebody might want to say something. So, here. to me, the businesses you met, re mentioned were not businesses, they're criminal organizations. So, they were not my statement. But of the, th out of the you take the S&P 500, there are 350 that have never had fraud against them. Some of those, not all of them, could be a model. Not because they're businesses, but because of the way they're run. That's, that's point number one. Uh, the, um, uh, on the universities, just as you said, they go through cycles of highs and lows, and they also have been admired in scandals. And most of them are, are profit-making machines when you look at what they're doing with the student loans and letting companies come in and serve the, and take over the cafeterias uh, with foods that aren't healthy for students. And this, you know they're involved in the student loan scandal. So you will find good and bad in all circles of life. So what I think we can agree with is that human nature will manifest itself equally in all fields of endeavor, whether or not it's a religion, whether or not it's government, or whether or not it's business, or whether it's a nonprofit world. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind as we're looking for standards in the nonprofit world. I agree. And, and Michael, you have a comment, and then we'll yeah. get to our audience yeah. member. Uh, as philanthropists, whether we're, we're givers or whether we're doers, uh, we're searching for new ways of addressing social problems in the world. And I, I mentioned two limitations in my, my first contribution. One was the lack of money, the limitation, because money is limited, and we can't solve all the problems as we would wish with philanthropic money. Uh, and the second is the scale of the problems and that they're growing in the world, and we do need to look for new solutions. Those solutions are not going to be like Enron. Uh, the idea of social enterprise is not the same as commercial enterprise. It's not Wall Street. It has its own code of ethics and conduct and, and structures and so on. But we are looking, exploring other ways of doing things. And it's a very creative time to be in this sector because of that. It's not to say that one is better than the other. Both will coexist. But at the moment, I think there are a lot of people looking to more enterprising solutions to social problems new structures and new ways to, 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 to work within in order to achieve that. May I have a moment? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I can see we've got some thoughts um, here. But make it brief because we have other questions. I'm a lawyer. I don't make anything too brief. Uh, that's uh, what you did for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Levine, uh, I really like you. Um, thank you for your candor. Uh, I'm a capitalist. And uh, the comments, at least from my perspective, uh, were not intended to favor business over nonprofits. Uh, the uh, nonprofit sector has done extraordinary things. Without it, never would have been done, clearly. Also, I have no opposition to grants. I think it is clearly has been, is, and will always be in the mix and should be. Uh, your comment about corporations, from my view, uh, I would not look to bring over a culture of any given corporation, but rather prudent business principles to the social sector. And I think the social sector will benefit. It is increasingly benefiting from applying business principles to social problems. Finally, your governance issue prompts me to make one further point, and I'll try to be brief. In the context of the L3C, the L3C is a form of limited liability company. It's a charitable limited liability company, but it's a for-profit. I've set up hundreds of companies over my professional career, nearly 40 years. And I can tell you, when you bring principles into a room to set up a business, conversation is going to surround the issues of money and control, period. When you set up a social enterprise, particularly an L3C, I, uh, and this I think may be the most underreported advantage of an L3C, from a governance perspective, everybody coming into that room, for-profit, non-profit, uh, institutional, foundation, they all have different perspectives, different cultures, different fiduciary obligations, but they understand what the other guy's after too. So the L3C allows for a harmonization of those different objectives so there is an opportunity to reconcile disparate interests and perspectives in an organization that otherwise may not even address dispute resolution. So everybody gets the benefit of their bargain. So I applaud you for your comments. I think they're, I think they're very provocative. 
uh, but I have a slightly different view as to each. Thank you. Know, you. We can't let Jane not have an opportunity. So if you could make a quick one and then we'll go. go. Um, yes, I, I wanted to point out a couple of things. I can't tell you how difficult a time I have placing our Bear Stearns volunteers um, with organizations. There's a little moral hesitation there. Um, <laughs> But uh, really, you know, I think one of the focus, I don't mean to say that we think that organizations shouldn't, shouldn't fundraise because, of course, they couldn't continue their program. So we really try and focus on, on providing projects that support that. If, a, if an organization gets a front page story on the New York Times because we set them up with a good PR volunteer, I think that's going to help with their fundraising. So we really focus on that aspect of it. Um, and then getting back to um, the idea of, a, of what it means to be a social enterprise, as a B Corporation, we get audited to make sure that you know, we're not just trying to make money and charging you know, more and more money for nonprofits and, and providing them with horrible volunteers and, and doing horrible things, we actually have to be audited that we're following our social mission. And if we don't do that, we lose our certification. And so that's, I think, a really important part of it um, you know, th as us being sort of straddling this nonprofit and for-profit world that we can't lose sight of either. Thank you. We had a couple of questions up here, right here, Robert. I'm, I'm Daniel Zhang from Bark Inc. I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question is about uh, the social enterprise. And uh, you mentioned social enterprise will be allowed to make investments, grant, uh, loans. I think that's terrific. That will have significant change. But on the other hand, uh, some people may worry that uh, uh, for some, uh, the companies receive investments from the uh, social enterprise. They may be also alternatively, alternatively, they can receive the loans investments from the traditional for-profit companies. So how can we ensure that uh, the social enterprise will not compete uh, with the, uh, uh, the for-profit companies uh, for the investment and uh, the loans because uh, then for in for-profit companies will be at a tax disadvantage to compete with uh, those opportunities. So this is uh, my first question. And my second question is especially uh, for Jane about uh, the catchafire.org. I think this is a terrific idea, a very good opportunity. But I think uh, at this time, to be honest, many people haven't heard about your organization. So, so I, I think at this time, have you considered applying your own business model to your own activities, which, which, yeah, which I mean is, for example, you can have one project, which is uh, for people who have uh, skills, uh, uh, say, uh, marketer at, uh, uh, let's, uh, Facebook to contribute uh, to market your own website. Or another people, say, have the skills to mark search engine optimization skill to market your website to appear higher on uh, Google. Then, say, uh, for those projects, it will make your website uh, more well-known in, in the people who are interested. Thank you. Now, did you have a, your first question directed to anyone in particular, or I can I choose? Because uh, we can't have too much more uh, round robin on this. Who, I think you should just uh, volunteer to help them do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to ask Michael about the first question, because I think it was a pretty provocative one and one that you were talking about a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> it is it is political season. But, but, uh, but, but I, th I, th I think there are people out there in the world, particularly individuals, who are looking for new and creative ways of supporting social action. Uh, not just writing a check as a, a, as a grant, but maybe getting a bit more involved. And I'd just like to talk about my project, Buzzbeak, since we... Uh, <laughs> we briefly, we briefly. Uh, well, we're trying to uh, redefine the relationship between the giver and the receiver, so that there's more of a partnership. Uh, and I'll, I'll just g uh, give an example, which is a book I'm writing where, where I'm trying to raise money to get it published on BuzzBank. <laughs> uh, I'm doing pretty well even before we've launched. But the idea is that I will, I will seek out readers before I write the book, uh, and they will help me in the writing of the book, and they'll help me in publishing it because there will be an audience for it. So everyone who invests in the book will get a copy of the book. Okay. And they'll also get a share of the revenue from the book. Well, there's a problem. And, uh, and, and if you invest more, you get a, a range of other benefits. Uh, if you invest £500, that's $750, you get a tandem tour of social enterprise with me, the author, for one day in London. I've already had three people sign up, and I know that one of them is a cyclist as well. So okay. we're going to take two tandems and spend the day looking and discussing social enterprise. Right. But what we're trying to give is opportunities for engagement and involvement 
to, to our supporters, who will become stronger and better supporters, who will leverage support and get their own friends and networks to support, and so on and so on. And I think that the, the, the traditional relationship with a, a, a donor recipient uh, has a huge scope for being made much more creative. I okay, think I well can answer this question if you'd like me to. Yeah, can you do it briefly? I, I want to get to Jane's I, I can only do it I think everybody. I can only do it briefly. And we've got time for two more questions. I, okay. I think, I, if I understood the question correctly, was social enterprise gets an unfair uh, competitive advantage over non-social enterprises. Uh, and I think you said from a tax perspective, understand that all of the uh, emerging social enterprise forms, including the L3C, are taxable. They're not tax exempt entities, nor are the contributions to them tax deductible. So there is no competitive advantage from a tax perspective. Okay, well, thank you. And Jane, quickly, what would you say in response to his question? We actually put up our first project for ourselves earlier this week, and we filled it really quickly in house. Um, so uh, we wouldn't be a very good volunteer organization if we didn't actually rely on volunteers. We don't really post those things up on the project on our site because we're focused on connecting other people, but we have someone who helps out with our SEO, we have somebody who helps out with PR, and they do do that on a pro bono um, basis. But you know, we're really focused on connecting our volunteers to other organizations, and I don't even want to get into the accounting of having to pay ourselves for our own service uh, <laughs> for finding the volunteers, but yeah. We definitely rely on them. Over here and then one Thank you. Where? Well, wow. over, over here on the left. Yeah. How about the woman right here? How about the? Two? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, one of you mentioned. I'm sorry, I can't remember who. The fact that nonprofits um, they take the risks to see if something's going to work so then that governments can scale it up, which is something that Bill and Melinda Gates have spoken a lot about as well. Is there a worry, though, that if uh, some of these for-profit charities um, start taking investments from the private sector, that there'll be less risk-taking? Go ahead, Glenn. I think I, that a comment was attributed to me, and I, I want to use this opportunity to reinforce what what Ms. Levine said about the great works of philanthropy. The Green Revolution in India had a lot to do with the Rockefeller Foundation. Let's not forget that. In spite of 50 years, you say the world's not a better place. I don't think it has anything to do with philanthropy. I think this is an example of what could come. Uh, I think you're absolutely onto something. I, I think that the, the, the challenge is that um, with, with more rigor, I've seen great organizations that are producing phenomenal results put through two years of rigorous due diligence by one investor, one donor, before they will give them $100,000. When the results are there, the passion of the leader is there, and the culture of the organization, from every time you spend it, uh, if you would just go visit the site, you'd feel the work happening. And so I, that gets back to what I'm saying about striking the balance between the numbers and using some judgment to make some decisions. I think that is a, a concern. I'd love to chat with you more about it afterwards because I know we're going to have an opportunity to do so um, when we have our lunch. That is correct. And we have time for one more question. In the middle here, how about this gentleman right here in the white shirt? And wait uh, for Robert to give you the microphone. This is going to be uh, on the internet afterwards. That's why we're so concerned about the audio. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, so I I really, really appreciate your comment. I am also a very large capitalist. Um, and one of it, I guess, it was uh, the, the attorney in the crowd that was talking about the mark, uh, the label that will define what is, what isn't. I, my role is I work a lot with, I, I probably spend about half of my day talking to social enterprises every, every day. And one thing that I found missing in all of the conferences I go to, the panels, the talks, is that people that were actually trying to help hardly ever show up at these places. Um, what, I think what you were saying earlier about uh, the gentleman that in Jane, about uh, what, I guess, the, the, the profit enterprise making a lot of profit, to me, unless they're Unless the organization empowers the people that we're trying to help and has a business model, it does not qualify as a social enterprise. To me, I would like to see more of the people that, that, that woman in India that was destitute, 
I'd like to see more of those people on the board of directors and having a controlling interest in the company and the organization. And I guess finally, my other, my other question is, and all this talk about investment and philanthropy and how those two really mix together, I think that is the answer or the most powerful thing. Um, this, earlier this, this month, I was privileged to work with an organization called Hillcap, Social Capital Markets, running their entrepreneur clubhouse. And many of them told me there's a problem of most of these organizations are not investable right, to an investable point. You can't make money by helping them, but you can't make money helping entrepreneurs. But you can't invest in them because they're not ready. So we were talking about the power, and now curious to know how you guys think of it, the power of using philanthropy as an R&D, as a failure, and being able to ask the philanthropy as a giver to accept failure and to cherish and celebrate failure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's have one person respond and then we can continue the conversation after the formal part here. So let's take one more minute for a response from who? Yes, go ahead, Mark. Uh, many of the emerging for-profit forms are subsidiaries of 501c3s, either pre-existing 501c3s or uh, de novo 501c3s created in conjunction with the uh, for-profit enterprise uh, for the very reason you described. The 501c3 can receive tax-deductible contributions and grants and then may seed or serve as an incubator for social purpose businesses that are not yet ready for funding on its own merit. So there are um, combinations of for-profits and non-profits that are, you know, all these linkages are very innovative and uh, uh, seek to address the very issue that you described. One quick final yeah. moment. Uh, the world will change because people want to change it and they have ideas, they have energy, they have passion, they have commitment. They'll go out and do things. They will also find people with resources who will be their partners. It's a free world and we can make our choices as to whom we want to support. Uh, the structures, the, the legalistics, the ter terminologies are all irrelevant. Uh, what we need are more people Going, wanting to use their passion to change the world and more people uh, to apply their resources to help that in a, in a sensible partnership of people doing things together. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think that's a great place to end today, and I want to thank Doug so much for a great job moderating. And our panelists, thank you so much. This was a great conversation.